Welcome, Louie. We're just talking about pedophilia. <laughs> oh, <laughs> good. Um, well, hey, Louie. So, Hi, that makes me feel welcome. He's one of my favorite filmmakers ever, but he has made a lot of movies. Did you ever see uh, Paths of Glory? Very human. All just about these people facing these different uh, conund- human conundrums. So it's it's less. I think it took that. There's. I don't think that it it felt or the movie was claiming in its aura to innovate that at all. Innovate that idea. That's not a new idea. It never could be. It put it in a new context. Kubrick did with his movies was he would take properties and and literature and just say, I don't care about this book. I'm going to make a movie based. I'm going to deconstruct this, make a movie based on it. Specific idea about cinema. Took the really banal idea of a couple that's hit a skid and have drifted apart and uh, started to have invasive thoughts uh, that are driving them apart from each other. But he put that into this incredibly high, thin atmosphere oxygen world of just the richest fucking guy in Manhattan. I mean, these are the richest people. Touch Earth. And also, that movie doesn't touch Earth. Not about anyone anyone knows. Nick, the piano player, is almost a surrogate in, like, a guy, but not really. I had read somewhere that the idea behind this movie was let's make a porn with a high, high uh, Hollywood couple, like a couple that's, you know, with really big uh, stars. I, mm. I heard somewhere that that was the idea, aha, a fine art, uh, fine film porn uh, starring really big, uh, high caliber actors, which is why they got those two, because they were married. Yeah, I don't know. It, it, that movie has a, this plotting tone, this pace that's very careful. It's what he does. Every Kubrick movie has these dialogues, like in uh, 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 Barry Lyndon, you know, Mr. Lyndon, he has fired his shot. Do you want to fire your shot? Yes. I. It's just like that. And then this fucking, you know, I, I dreamt that I fucked a man. It just, uh, and, and, I happen to like it. It's a weird, it's like mm-hmm. if he was a comic book artist, you would say this is how he draws. And it wouldn't make sense. It doesn't make sense with, if you were going to go and make a movie of this subject, you'd do it differently. He was out of his mind at that point. I believe that he was a master filmmaker. And so I don't question, I don't go like, yeah, he didn't do it right. I just go, this is where he was at. And this is what his fucked up brain was making. And uh, so I'll just, I, I don't judge a movie like that by any movie by a guy like that. However, I don't watch Eyes Wide Shut over and over again. I don't. It, it, a lot of his other films I do. It's not conveying. Uh, the thing is with movies, it's sometimes it's like we want to convey this story. We want to make people feel what this. I don't think that that's his goal. And I think the crazier he got, this is the last work he did. And he was living in London in exile and seclusion from all people. I don't know much about him personally, but I don't gather that he had a really social life with family. And again, I would say that the, what you're watching is not someone trying to get things right. It's a it's a deluded, crazy guy who had made too many high altitude films, and he was not. He didn't have. He had a distorted view of the world, and the valid. What's valid about the movie is what is a guy how does a guy like that see the world he doesn't understand he doesn't understand the world but he tried the wrongness of that the of the tone of that scene uh, uh creates a sense of it, it makes the movie what it is to me i go well, i don't even this isn't what are these streets in new york city and <laughs> what part of the village is i forget the names of the streets are really strange like james street or something and they don't it doesn't quite um, it doesn't quite add up, and it's it's like a drunk, uh, a, a a person in a uh, inside of a, a cell in a mental hospital telling you a story from he doesn't even remember what the world looks like anymore, and that's just what it is. That overdose on bathroom floors don't lie in these these poses, right. you know, with the perfect <laughs> breath and these like you know painted onto a bathroom floor from an overdose. It's yeah. weird. The whole movie's weird. I think he had lost grip on his tools at that point. I will say that. I don't think he had, you know, I mean, I, I the thing about Kubrick isn't 
was just he was weird. He was a weird dude. And every single thing he did had there's jokes in every movie he made. Funny jokes in Paths of Glory about these three guys who've been sentenced to death to be shot by a firing squad uh, because they supposedly let their platoon down. There's this scene of the them the night before they're going to be executed. And there's the guy with the, the eye that drifts over, that guy he has in a lot of his movies that his eye drifts to the right. Uh, but this other guy who plays, by the way, in Blade Runner, the guy who uh, uh, Roy smushes his eyes in, the guy who runs the Blade Runner company, he's one of the guys in Paths of Glory, one of the soldiers. And he, he's also Floyd, he's also the, he's having a mental breakdown and he says, uh, I'm going to be dead tomorrow. I'm not going to be in, on this earth. And he sees a cockroach on the table and he says, that cockroach is going to be closer to my wife and kids tomorrow than I am. And uh, the other guy goes, then they stand in FAO shorts and talk about how dangerous that was and how it was their marriage is so fragile. It's like, it's very bourgeois, you know, it's very uh, people with all this fucking money and maids and stuff. And, uh, you know, ooh, she had a dream and he walked the streets. <laughs> then he challenges her and he says, you woke up laughing. She says that. And I've, by the way, I've done that when I've told a girlfriend about a dream where it's something that I'm like, she may not like that I <laughs> dreamt this. I don't know why I'm sharing it with her, but I'll pretend I was upset. She wakes up laughing, cruel, and he points it out to her. He says, you weren't, you weren't. That happened before that. But again, the movie is set in a, in a really rare air. I, it's meant, I think he is, he's taking these 1920s social mores. Why his distortion of reality is important, even though it didn't quite get there, and uh, is that... Uh, we we know. I think there's a lot of that with movies and TV now that when people criticize it, they go, this isn't up to where what we're all at. And with our conscious and our understanding, okay, well, this is a movie about people who aren't. Why do, does every movie have to be like a statement of the of the collective? Like, here's what we've all learned about life. A movie from someone who's myopic or, or shallow or uh, re backwards is more interesting. I don't want to watch anything by somebody who's kind of like caught up on, you know, where shit's at right now. That's nowhere. Sitcoms, the old ones, like or even the Flintstones did this, where they they got some crazy scheme going. Finally get caught. You can't have Fred Flintstone stand there and go, well, I had to pretend to be this. And then and she would go, what happened? And then you there was specific music and the Flintstones for this. They go, and he goes, so that's why watching it right before this. I only watched like the first half, which is interesting to do right before talking about it, because the second half, all everything that happens on that ship with Hal and everything, and then the ending is so big and it makes you, it shrinks in your memory the first half. The first half is a very important, it's interesting because it's not unlike uh, um, Full Metal Jacket, that there's a first half and a second half that are kind of cut off from each other, but the one sets up the other. It doesn't. It's not story that continues into the second half. It's it's a, sec a mini story that informs what you're about to watch. First part of the movie is about this guy, Dr. Joyce, who just, his story just ends. It doesn't come to, it doesn't get any conclusion. And Kubrick isn't that interested in him as a person. He gives him one personal scene where he's calling his daughter, which is made so, to make it clear to you, don't worry about this guy. He's not a father <laughs> who has issues. He's not like in a bad marriage. He tells his daughter, I can't make it to your birthday. And it isn't like a bad dad moment. Cause she's like, you can't, I wish you could. And he goes, yeah, well, I can't. This is, I can't. <laughs> Daddy can't be there. But the thing that amazed me about it, a few, I just wanted to, this is what I was, I wrote. Um, first of all, the pigs and the monkeys together. I don't know how he did that. It's not clear to me how he accomplished any of this in 1968. I don't understand how we had these these monkey people, obviously in suits, but really good ones. Space and space and apes is a thing that Americans we even sent apes into space. It's a thing. So there's apes and there's pigs all around them, and they're yelling at the pigs, and the pigs aren't leaving. And I don't know how the fuck where they got these weird pigs that I don't. Um, and then there's a wildcat that kills a fucking guy. I don't know how they did that, and it has yellow eyes. Yeah. I don't know how they got a wildcat to attack this guy. It's not CGI. It's not a puppet. It's not clay. 
it's fucking real looking. Then um, there, it's it, this movie has feeling because these beasts are scared in the cave because there's roaring, and they're they look depressed, and they're traumatized and scared. And then when that thing comes with the weird people going, which was, this is why Kubrick was just weird. He was a weird dude. And he suggested a aura of energy with a chorus of people singing. And you see the apes trying to touch the thing. And, and at first it's sort of too hot to touch, but then they're able to really smoothen it. And then he has this incredible, um, in uh, restraint because just as that scene is warming up, it cuts. It's just suddenly over. You don't really resolve it. Quiet, peaceful shots of this fucking probably uh, Joshua tree. And you're left going, what the fuck? What the fuck happened? He's willing to do that. And most filmmakers today won't do it because, because audiences have demands. I want it to be clear and I want to know what's happening. But he goes, we're just starting to show you this and now we're taking it away from you. And you're going, what the fuck happened? And it keeps you a little nauseous and unsure, keeps you from digging into the, into the batting uh, uh, thing. The very opening of the movie is like an orchestra tuning up suggestion. There is black, before you see MGM, there's black and you just hear this pulsing, you just hear the strings. And then you get, the MGM logo. This is so there's something pre MGM logo. And then the it's bum bum bum. And it has a theatrical opening. Stanley Kubrick. 2001. And all this this thing. And then you get this really strange sequence with the animals. And the thing I you know, like like Joe was telling me when we were talking about it before, the the novel explains a lot. The novel's very clear. The novel's very detailed and precise. And what Kubrick did with cinema was to say, let's take out all that clarity and replace it with mysterious ambiguity that makes you, everyone's brain decide a different thing about what they're seeing. I think that's the greatest thing about his work of this kind. And Kubrick says he wanted to suggest these things. He wanted to give people a feeling of this stuff, explaining it. And it wasn't meant to be like, oh, well, that's not what people saw, so we did it wrong. He kind of just gave you these, these brush strokes to give you that that feeling and this monolith is left totally unexplained and mysterious something you couldn't do in cinema today unless you got at some point explained absolutely everything i was talking to my girlfriend lunch about the about how weird it is that we all walk around with these with these rectangles that we walk around with black rectangles staring into them they rule our whole lives and she pointed out that it's like the fucking monolith. Very specific moment in this movie where the, the monkey throws the bone in the air. It's almost corny, but it's good. The bone tumbles through the air and it becomes a spaceship. Beautiful music starts and it kind of suggests that there is beauty in our aggression. Leads to, uh, to, to things that are celestial and beautiful. And then he has this sequence to get you to the moon that takes a long time. And... It's plotting and it's slow, but there's a point behind it. And especially for the time it was made. When did we land on the moon? Spaceship movies, but it was just about the kind of boyish, you know, <laughs> like silver, wee, wee, you know, and like, ah, turn the laser beam on the thing and monsters. It just, it wasn't, they weren't serious movies.